is that if the if the task of the first passage is for the father to find the man within the boy and call then call him forth the task of the second passage is to find the boy within the man and to bring him home along the way we have believed a false narrative we aren't something we aren't good enough big enough strong enough man enough we then interpret those and then begin to tell a narrative of who we are as a result of those part of the deep work is to reintegrate you know wholeness is all about bringing all of the parts of us back together so that we can be you know if a masterpiece of god is like a vase or a, a you know a stained glass window that has been shattered to re reintegrate it is to bring all those shattered pieces back together and allow the Spirit of God to renew what was originally made. Welcome to the Kindling Fire. My name is Troy Mangum. God is preaching a sermon to the world through people's lives. People's experience, history, and testimonies all point to some amazing attribute of God that you too can experience. I interview revolutionaries, fire starters, and troublemakers. This podcast is here to be a voice of encouragement in your life. A voice that says, with God you can, and with God you will step into the abundant life. So let's get rolling. Okay, today on The Kindling Fire, I have a new friend, Chris Bruno, on the show. Thank you, Chris, for coming on the show. Absolutely great to be here. Thanks. So uh, Chris is a licensed professional counselor out of Colorado and has been trained underneath uh, actually Dan Allender. Um, and that school, I believe is, well, tell me the name of the school. It's in Seattle. Yeah, it's uh, it's called the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. That's that's just fascinating. I love both of Isn't those. Isn't it great? Like those two <laughs> things get together yeah. in the same sentence. So. That is a great yeah. And so, um, so one of the areas that, uh, you run a counseling practice out in Colorado. Um, and so tell us a little bit about, uh, that and a little bit about yourself, just a snapshot of your, you know, quick snapshot of your life. And then we can get sure. into the topic we're going to get into. All right. Well, I'll start with a snapshot of my life. So I've been married close to 28 years. I have three almost adult kids. 22, 19, and 16. Um, so 16 year old is just recently driving. And so she's mostly not home either anymore, as we all know. So um, I spent a good portion of the beginning of our marriage uh, working in corporate world for the Campbell Soup Company, and then felt kind of the call of God to go into ministry and missions. And so my wife and I, we moved from Chicago over to the Middle East, where, where we spent 10 years serving uh, in, the, in the Middle East. And then after that, transitioned to the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology, which is where uh, kind of second career training for the next portion of my life. Uh, I got a counseling degree there and then moved 13 years ago to Colorado to launch uh, both Restoration Project and Restory Counseling. So Restory Counseling is that counseling practice that you mentioned. We've got about 20 or so on our team. Half of them are local. Half of them are scattered across the United States doing deep story work with people. Hmm. Um, then uh, Restoration Project is a nonprofit ministry focused on helping men recover their hearts. And we focus in the area of fatherhood, intentional fatherhood, intentional brotherhood, and then really deep, a deep dive into what does it mean to be a son of God? So those are the kinds of things that we do. Happy to explain any more than that. But that's the kind of quick flyby overview. Yeah, that's great. So so I, I am curious about the restoration project. Is ah. I'm really curious about the means. Uh, I know it's the Holy Spirit, but but giving the Holy Spirit opportunity, is it small groups? Is it conferences? Is it training? Is it coaching? Is it, what is it? What does that yeah, look like? Yeah, great questions. So we, uh, this is how we talk about it. We are experience and resource architects. So we create experiences for men, and some of those experiences are we facilitate them. You can kind of come with us on a father-son or father-daughter expedition in the backcountry. Uh, we have father-son and father-daughter experiences that you can do at home with your children, uh, that kind of stuff. We have brotherhood experiences that are small groups that you can participate, use some of our resources to do in, in and around your own community, but then also things that you can join us in. So we're not like big conference kinds of people because we really believe that the gospel is best 
experienced and most transformative in the context of intimate and close relationships right where God planted you to be. And so we're always trying to help grow people uh, where they are versus have them come to us. Yeah, so... so uh Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go for it. Uh, so, one, so I always love having counselors on the show because, um, you know, it always reminds me of that, that uh, scripture, and I don't have the reference, but it basically means that the heart of a man are deep waters and a man of understanding draws them out, uh, you know, and it's the idea that, that God gives certain giftings to draw people out of deep waters, right? You know, truth and, and, and they just have a certain gifting. And, and so, so I always love having counselors on. And so because you're a counselor, I've been in counseling much of my life and, and the audience is aware of that. So here's what I really want to dig into, and then we'll kind of take it from here. Um, first off, before I start asking some hard questions, the, the men that you counsel, are they the teenagers? Are they the 50-somethings? Are they the 30s and 40 strugglers? Like where... Is it all across the board? Like, do you have a specialty in who you counsel? Uh, I would say no, not a specialty as far as age. So I've worked with teenagers, I've worked with kids, and then I've worked with, you know, I think like a 90-year-old was my oldest guy that I worked with. <laughs> I love, absolutely love that a 90-year-old was willing to do some heart work. So that's, that's incredible. Actually, in, uh, in April, I have an intensive that I'm doing for five men, and I think one of the, the oldest guys that is coming, I think is about 85. So I just- That's amazing. But I love it. Um, but the if there is a specialty for me personally, now in Restory Counseling, we see men and women and children and families and marriages and all that. But for me personally, my specialty is, uh, is absolutely in working with men. And really kind of my sweet spot is like that 30, 35, up through about 55, 60 kind of range. So really in that um, established- kind of, you know, your man, you've grown up, you're, you're, you establish your life, your family, your career, and you're starting to recognize like some of the, the patterns of your past are not serving you in your present or in your future. And so where, where you are, are recognizing some of the fragility of your heart, that's really where I love to step in. And, and man, sure that's, not. that's very affirming. Cause one of the things that I recognized in my own life and I started, and as I ran in men's circles, uh, the late thirties would start showing up. Mm -hmm. And usually that's about the time that here's my, you know, internal manual of how I'm going to do this thing, right. Yeah. In my twenties and you go at it and you go hard, 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 hard. And then, you know, in that kind of like mid 30 range, it kind of like runs out. You're like, wow, <laughs> yeah, marriage isn't working out like a, you know, the career, the, the internal six, you know, you yeah. know, all the things. And you're kind of like, Maybe everything that I thought I knew, maybe I've got something else to learn. And they start like wandering into these men's circles, kind of like, you know, just kind of like dipping their toe in the water versus, hey, I know what I'm doing. Like, yes. I got the internal manual. This is how I, now I'll teach you, you know, they, I'll, you know, they want to be the teachers and they want to do all these things. But around that mid 30 time is when they, I don't know if it's humility or reality or what it is, but it's a interesting time window. It is an interesting time window and, you know, various authors write about the kind of seasons of a man's life and um, the way that I've kind of conceived of it, especially in uh, the book Sage is about um, that time period being what I would call the warrior stage. A lot of people call that the warrior stage mm -hmm. you've kind of gone through the boyhood. You've gone through your kind of sexual awakening. You've maybe established a family, you've gotten married and you're, you're, conquering the hill. You're like taking the hill. And what you just described was the script of what it means to be a man is only, and by and large in our in our uh, society, is really only warrior type mentality mm. of achieve, build, succeed, conquer. And uh, what we're not prepared for is when the warrior actually receives some woundings that he doesn't know what he's what to do with. Hmm. And somewhere out there on the field, uh, he's been betrayed, or he's had some loss, or there's been some level of confusion or abandonment. Or like I just said a minute ago, the fragility of his heart no longer sustains the level of intensity of his life. 
And so he's like, I can't keep going at the same level of warrior intensity that I always thought I could. And so therefore, like he starts to enter into what I call the wounded man stage. Hmm. Wounded man stage is where he kind of recognizes either those things are not sufficient any longer, or like I just said, he has, you know, some significant wounds. He needs to, he needs to take some time away and, and head over to the infirmary for a little bit and just tend to his wounds. That scares men to death. Doesn't it? It absolutely does. Cause it's sort of like saying, you know, I'm made for fill in the blank, your favorite sport. <laughs> I'm, you know, I, I am the guy I'm going to do. And it's sort of like, Hey, why don't you take off a few seasons? You're like, w- and do what? <laughs> you Who know, am I? Why? Who am I I don't do that? Yeah. yeah. And it's like, I'm just, what I just like just put a gun to my, my, the things that I'm all about. And just for what, for what purpose? Like there's gotta be, some, but people will do it when it's a uh, crisis happens. And that's usually what forces men's hands. At least that's been my experience. And Trey, what ends up happening is, uh, is that men come to that precipice and either, and, and I'll give either, there's a third option, but let me start with the first two. Either I see men circling back to kind of redouble their efforts and kind of hunker down and make sure, try again uh, in some kind of way. Maybe I married the wrong woman or decided the wrong career or did the wrong sport or whatever it is like that. They kind of circle back to those efforts again, or they come to that precipice and they're just like, I'm just going to jump off the cliff. I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to, you know, screw it all, <laughs> like give up. And they go into the place of apathy and just, uh, you know, this despondence that just settles over them that I'm just going to make it till retirement is what mm-hmm. I'm going to do. I'm yeah, just going to give up. up and, down and, and 40, it's, it's as good as it's going to be. And why would I have expected it to be any better? And so therefore, I'm just going to kind of put in my time and make it to retirement. It's kind of like it, losing heart. Yeah, absolutely. It's losing heart. Absolutely. Yeah. It's losing heart. And I think there's a third way. I think there is something else that God offers us. Um, Just a few weeks ago, I was leading a men's trip of 14 men in Ireland, and we were kind of going through a journey where we were using the topography and geography of the land in order to explore the landscape of our own hearts. And as we crossed over the, the country, the island of Ireland, we came to the cliffs, and and the way that I languaged it was you know, we come through the first half of our lives and eventually we run out of land and we come to the end of ourselves and we're facing the sea and we can look back at the land. And just as I said, redouble our efforts, we can kind of jump off this cliff. And that actually leads to, as I said, the despondence or the end of your life, or you can actually begin to imagine what would it look like for me to find a different vehicle to take me into the next half, into the next season of my life? Because the, the van that we drove across the island was not going to get us any further beyond those cliffs. We needed to find a different vehicle to go beyond. And I feel like that's what we're talking about. The third way is, is, is there a new way? Is there a way to go deeper into our own lives and our own stories? And then also still have an imagination of what is possible beyond the edge of that land. You know, one of the things that I was so keen to ask John Eldridge years ago when he came on the show was, so why, what's the point, basically? Like, you're going to go in, you're going to excavate, and you're going to go into the wound. But I've also seen people circle that drain, and it's like, now I'm just the wounded guy, right? And and he was able to, our you know, kind of respond saying, that's a means to an end, mm-hmm. right? And so I'd be very curious your take on, on sort of uh, maybe the 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 pitfalls on either side, but what is that path through? You know, mm-hmm. it's like if you're going to be the man that says, "I'm not going to jump off the cliff and I'm not going to get," you know, or "I'm not going to just redouble the thing that's not been working." Well, what are the pitfalls of that path yeah. you know, on either side, and and what would you recommend that path through look like? And any kind of time window too. Men love to have some kind of boundaries, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, let, yeah, let me start with boundaries. I feel like, you know, there's the reason I really like working with men personally in that 35 ish kind of to the 55 range is that there is an awareness that something needs to change. 
Mm. That they have come to the end of themselves. They have come to the end of their efforts. The script isn't working. And they're right there standing going, now what? What do I do? And the ones that are actually, you know, honest and bold are the ones that say, I don't know what to do. I don't mm. know what to go. So um, some of the pitfalls of circling back is that, you know, what is the definition of insanity? Always trying to do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Result, right. Like that's, that's that, that is circling back. Um, and then yeah. also like we were designed to really be um, important uh, to how to bring our, our glory to bear on the earth that God is actually revealed in the masterpiece, like the master is re revealed in the masterpiece. And so there's something about who we were designed to be, to bring about the weight of who God is through understanding and discovering the weight of who we are. Mm. That is what I think, you know, pressing in and moving on into this. Um, I have uh, a book called The Man Maker Project, and it's all about an intentional rites of passage process for a father to lead a son through the journey of boy into manhood. Um, and then I've mentioned Sage. That's another book about the intentional journey of going from a man into a sage. And the way that I language it, Troy, is, is that if the, if the task of the first passage is for the father to find the man within the boy and call, then call him forth, the task of the second passage is to find the boy within the man and to bring him home. Hmm. There is something about the story of the little boy in me, the little boy in you, the little boy in all of us, where along the way we have believed a false narrative. We have believed a false script. And that is that we aren't something. We aren't good enough, big enough, strong enough, man enough, uh, wise enough uh, that we believe these interpretations that come along as a result of the stories that have been done to us, we then interpret those and then begin to tell a narrative of who we are as a result of those. And so some of the work I think of going into the wound is not just to, like you said, circle the drain of the wound, but it is actually to go back and find the exiled parts of our hearts the lost and forgotten parts of our hearts that the false narrative has convinced us are actually true hmm. back into those places of our stories where I said, yeah, you weren't good enough. Mm -hmm. it, and, and it, again, you know, I certain language for this, but it sounds like it's sort of like, you know, breaking the vows, dropping false beliefs, but, but even recognizing that you hold them at a very deep level. Yes. Is that accurate? What I just said? You, you, ha you hold them at a deep level. You've buried them at a deep level. You have exiled them significantly. There is so much inside of us that we, um, we find uh, contempt for, we find shame for, uh, we find, you know, it is better for us to survive in the world than to attend to those places in our lives, especially as younger people. And so we forget them. We push those parts of us away. And I think part of part of the deep work is to reintegrate, you know, wholeness is all about bringing all of the parts of us back together so that we can be, you know, if, if a masterpiece of God is like a vase or a, a, you know, a stained glass window that has been shattered, to reintegrate it is to bring all those shattered pieces back together and allow the spirit of God to renew what was originally made, renew so, again what he originally designed. So uh, let me throw something out at you because the, the term that really strikes me is, you know, the idea that the role in the kind of warrior to sage role is to restore the boy. Um, and it reminds me of, um, you know, everybody loves the Lord of the Rings, you know, analogies. But I mean, Gandalf was playing with fireworks, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in like early in the storyline, yeah. and and you know, very much enjoying it. And 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 the, you know, the hobbits were thinking it was really fun. And and I can think of like a grandfather who is playful with their grandchildren. Um, there is a childlikeness in this. Mm -hmm. I, I it's um I don't know not all serious and you know and so I'd be very curious like I, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody articulate that and 
And I just be very curious what your opinion is of that, that oh, how that looks. A hundred percent. So one of my favorite passages of scripture is where Jesus is actually confronting the disciples for keeping the children away. And in that passage, I'm not going to quote it or read it or anything, but in that passage, he basically says like, let the little children come for, as you become like a child, you will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And I think that is actually something that is a call to us as adult men to address those parts of us that we have exiled and lost, as I've said, and bring those boyhood parts of us back together. And yes, play is one of them. Play is definitely one of them. Innocence is one of them. Mm. Having a sense of like a generosity of spirit where we kind of lay down all the blacks and whites that we have, you know, the yeses and nos, the the rights and wrongs that, that we've come to believe. But there's a generosity of like, I get to be in a space where God is bigger and more mysterious than I at once believed in my life. Like that's super playful. Mm. And, and that God is also playful with us. Every sunrise, every you know, animal, every moment that there is uh, some kind of joyous uh, reconciliation or a moment of of play is is a place where God exists. And so, yes, absolutely. And how many of us men don't have that? Mm-hmm. How many of us men, you know, we play, maybe we like to watch the Super Bowl or we like to, you know, play catch or do something like that with our kids. But really, do we actually allow our hearts to play? in the midst of relationships, in the midst of my own, my own self, um, on that trip to Ireland, one of the things that, that we did do was we went kayaking. Um, and, uh, you know, during, we had 14 guys. And so there were several kayaks and, and just to be out there on the water and just play and race and, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, splash water on each other and all that, it's not all serious. And what does it do in the context of our stories? What does it open up? in the context of the interchange of our stories and awareness of what is actually happening in, uh, in that story space and uh, between us and in me, because yeah, I could say a lot about my own story and the little boy that I played with on, in those kayaks Mm -hmm. and some of the fear that he experienced, some of the joy that he experienced and the redemption he experienced just as we were out for an afternoon in the kayaks. Yeah. Well, I guess that's kind of one question I, I definitely have to dig into is sort of like, Let's let's kind of say you've had a lot of men come through your doors and and you've interacted a lot with men in this way. And what would what does like an an in an old an older integrated man like look like? Like mm-hmm. you like you know I'm like like one of the things I'm convinced of is men need models. Yeah. You know, we have we have a lot of teaching. We have very few people who be like You know, like I remember one time getting struck by an older man in church dancing. He was like the only guy. And I was like, that guy, that guy's free. He may look dumb, but he is happy and doesn't care. There's a freedom about him that he has that I don't have. Yes. You know, and so I'm very curious, like, thinking about some of the, your, your, yourself or, or other friends or people that you've tried to help, like, what does that look like? You know, what, you know, having gone through the hard work and, you know, like, I don't know, is that too yeah, yeah, yeah. question? Yeah. Or? <laughs> I mean, I, I would say I, I definitely can, can say that there are some clear characteristics of what it means to be an integrated reintegrated or reintegrating man, not that we ever fully arrive, but, but one that is doing some of that work. You know, um, the first one that comes to mind is when, when this man walks into the room, he doesn't take up all the oxygen Hmm. and everyone else breathes a sigh of relief. Hmm. There's a sense of like, he doesn't need all the attention. He doesn't need it to be about him. He doesn't fill the big space. And I'm not talking about introvert, extrovert kinds of things. It's just, it doesn't have to be about him, that there is a a settled contentment that happens that he is content to be who he is, where he is, and you get to be who you are, and he gets to be who he is. And there's nothing that he has to prove anymore. Mm -hmm. And, And also there is a level of strength and tenderness that are combined inside of him that you know that he can hold his own and he's also not going to take your head off that kind of contentedness that kind of spaciousness really in in my mind my mind is a hallmark 
hallmark of a sage. Mm. I mean, I, think I mentioned earlier, even that, you know, generous spirituality that he's like, tell me where you're at and you're not going to surprise me and you're not going to scare me and you're not going to make me like quote all the scriptures to you and make sure that you, you know, change your thinking right now. It's just like, you get to be where you're going to be and I will hold out hope for you um, to actually find the answers to the questions that you're asking. That is also a hallmark of a sage. I think he's also really familiar with suffering, really familiar with suffering because he has walked through some of those dark valleys of his own. Mm-hmm. And he has is, is been able to come out the other side, not that things are all tied up in a bow and everything is pretty, but he recognizes the depth of the groaning of his heart, matching the groaning of the spirit, that this is not the world that we were meant to live in. And this is where I live. So I'm going to hold the both and the, the now and the not yet and, and recognize suffering is and will be. And there is a good God. And mm-hmm. there is, there is a, a future kingdom that is yet to come. Um, so if you were a young man and, you know, in your thirties and you came across, you know, the men at the gate, right. The count, the council of elders, the, the, the sage circle, whatever. Right. Um, and you were to walk up, what would your experience, what do you think that man, man's experience would be of that? Of those men at the gate? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, I, I think a couple things. One is, especially since we don't have gates like that anymore, the reality is that in the Hebrew culture, those men were identified as kind of the pinnacle of manhood, not the warrior, not the king, but the sage, the elder. Mm-hmm. And so for a 16 year old, a 30 year old to look at those older men, it was always, that is where I hope to be. That is what I hope to become. That is the destination that I hope to arrive at, at some point in my life. Um, mm-hmm. So they probably would have sought, you know, just sitting in their presence. What do you see? Teach me about nature. Teach me about God. Teach me about women. Teach me about law. Teach me about commerce, like all of those kinds of things and not asking for advice, but far more asking for presence. Hmm. And I think that's what, you know, that's what we don't have. You just said we don't have models for a lot of this in our, in our world, because we assume that we want to ask the, and we want to ask, and then older men assume that's what, what we need from them is their advice. We have YouTube for advice these days. (laughs) We don't need, I, my, my wash machine right, right now is at home in like several parts because it's broken. Did I ask another man what to do? No, I asked YouTube. Right. But what I get from another man is his presence and his eyes and his care and his tenderness that comes towards me that will hold me and say, hey, I know you can do what you need to do today. That's ultimately what I think a sage is. Hmm. As a 16 year old, I was an exchange student in Germany and um, I took with me only three English fiction books. So I was there for a whole year. And so these three books were the only English literature that I had. You know, it was a post home that spoke German. I was in, in uh, uh, a German school and all that. So it was my only place to go actually like still think in, in English beautifully orchestrated by God. These books presented to me, it was, they were Christian historical fiction and they presented to me some characters from ancient, you know, uh, England who were these kinds of sages and they, the way that they engaged the the characters as, as the author wrote them were just so brilliant as a 16 year old. I was like, I want to be like those guys. Mm-hmm. I want to be that. And I don't have anybody in my life. And so when I go home after this year, I'm going to find somebody like that and continue to like, you know, sidle up to them so that I can just soak up their presence. Yeah. When, when, when you have people that come through your office and, and let's say, you know, they're getting better or, or, you know, whatever the, do you, is it normative that they would spin off of the relationship with you into integrated relationships with others? Yeah. Okay. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Cause I think sometimes there is an Achilles heel with men sometimes where it's kind of like, they don't make that transition they have folks like you and others, pastor, maybe that will help them, but there's a, there's a transition they need to make from, okay, you're, you know, you, you don't need to stay in the hospital bed, you know, like for the rest of your life, like it's time to get up and 
move the legs that you didn't, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. okay, you got to put this stuff in practice. Like what, what, would, what do you recommend to men like that? Like how, what do you hope for them? Well, I, my hope is that honestly, my hope is that there wouldn't be a need for my job. Hmm. Amen. Okay. That ultimately, if we had other men and other people who had the capacity to listen to stories and share their presence and be curious before they speak, like all of that, if we had those kinds of communities where the tending to the brokenness and the and the stuckness and the confusion and the and, and the sin and all that kind of stuff in the past, if we had people that could tend to those things, we wouldn't actually need the kind of field of counseling as we as we have it now. Now, for sure, there's some biological realities to some mental health disorders and all of that. So I, I'm not talking about those. I'm just talking about kind of the general tending to each other's hearts. Mm-hmm. Relationship. Um, I mean, you mentioned Dan Allender earlier. He talks about how um, what is broken in relationship is healed in relationship. Mm-hmm. And that is the way of Jesus. What is broken in the relationship with God is only healed in relationship with God. And so what is broken in relationships in our lives and stories as humans is healed in other relationships with other humans. And so some of the work that I hope to do is to be a surrogate for that for a season. Mm -hmm. Explore and tend to and care for and, and allow people to borrow some of uh, some of my hope for them or some of my, you know, uh, desire for them that maybe they've lost their own desire, whatever it is, in order to then create some communities elsewhere. And that in the in the Ministry of Restoration Project, that is why we focus one of our primary departments is around brotherhood, not because we think, you know, we need to have better sports teams, but mm-hmm. because we actually need to train men how to be brothers with one another to care for and be in relationship with one another that both plays and also pursues yeah, and also uh, is curious about each other's stories and also, you know, does a whole bunch of things that men enjoy just because, right? So that sense of like the brotherhood of men is actually a holding ground. I think I want to say a training ground maybe, but also mostly a holding ground for men to do the kind of deep work that they have. But the reality is we don't have those kinds of communities. We don't have those kinds of uh, friends. And um, what we end up having are just buddies. Maybe we have some friends, but we certainly don't have brothers. Those kind of circles of depth. And so we need to train men on how to be those brothers. Um, So my hope is that the work that we do in counseling then does lead. And I'm often like pressing on people, like who are some men in your world and your life and your community that maybe we could bring into your life uh, to, to develop some of that brotherhood relationship. So I got, uh, I got two more questions for you before we kind of wrap up. So yeah. this, uh, this first one is um, you, you very, um, again, you have a very privileged opportunity to kind of peer into the soul and the, and the heart of man. And the thing I would ask is what have you found about the nature of the heart? You know, the heart is very, you know, there's a lot of theology teaching on it. There's a lot of psychology teaching on it, but you're kind of right in the front of it. And, Mm -hmm. and as a trained person to see things like, what have you found about the nature of the heart? Like what it's like and how it, you know, just, yeah, anything that you can offer there, I'd be I'd be curious what your take yeah, is on that. That is a fantastic question. So a few minutes ago, I said something about the masterpiece. And one of the things that I, f- I firmly believe is that when God originally thought up each individual person before they ever existed, and this is the, you know, Ephesians talks about this, that before we even existed, that we were a delightful thought in the mind of God that he found delight in us. And Mm -hmm. that delight was actually his first thought. That is the first story of who you and I were ever designed or created to be was in the, in the mind of God. And he delighted in that thought so much that he then orchestrated all of history to bring about your existence, specifically you. And in the image of God, as we are created in the image of God, the unique fingerprint of God, uh, that is emblazoned on each and every every human in the likeness of God. Uh, the way I like to talk about it is 
that we uh, as humans are a, like a billion or trillion sided diamond that you the reflection of who you are uh reflects who god is to the world in your own unique way and me too and the next guy and the next guy and the next guy and so the more that i get to know the real and true hearts of men the more i actually get to know the heart of god oh that's beautiful okay and so when when i begin to explore the places of the heart where the enemy comes to steal kill and destroy is directly against the face of God in you and the face of God in the next guy and the face of God in the next guy. And we come to believe that that the way I talk about it is like the first story is overwritten by the second story. That second story being the story the enemy wants to tell or the world wants to tell or brokenness wants to tell or sinfulness wants to tell that that is, you know, you were talking about agreements and stuff before the vows that we make. That is the second story. So I actually believe that the heart is buried underneath the the first story heart is buried underneath the second story narrative mm. so the more that we can come to recognize what how the second story has been played out what we have come to believe about ourselves and even uh hope to venture to a uh, desire to imagine that there may be uh as aslan talks about in c.s lewis's chronicles of narnia that there is a magic deeper still that before the beginning of time that there was something more true about you that then got ruined by the broken and fallen world what what would it be like for us to go back and imagine that that story that is deeper still is actually still true man that's powerful okay, yeah so that's it Heart. It reminds me of the Ecclesiastes scripture. He has put eternity in our hearts. Yes. Yes. Because the thing that I think is that there was a season when I was very upset that my heart was wounded, very upset because I was like, I'm of a certain age and this shouldn't matter. This should not matter. Like, why am I upset emotionally by something that happened to me when I was eight or whatever? And then eventually through kind of teaching and wisdom of others, I came to realize the heart is a timeless thing. Mm -hmm. And my logic was like, logically heart, seven-year-old heart, you should be acting like whatever age I was 30 years old and you should just get over it. And it's a logical that you feel this way. And I was very upset about it. But when I came to appreciate that, there is a timelessness to the heart. Therefore, wounds are timeless. Therefore, glory is timeless. And that it's not a logical being. It's just, it's childlike very much in some, in, in the how it interacts with time. And I know I'm treating it like it's a separate thing from who we are, but it's sort of like, it's a very different thing than the way we think. And men are so cerebral. Like the heart is dangerous waters. It's just like, I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Well, thank you so much for entertaining me on that question. So let's, let's end up with just hearing a little bit more about Sage. Um, it yeah. sounds like that was a book you recently, uh, you know, are offering to, to folks kind of wanting to move towards that stage. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So it's called Sage, uh, a man's guide into his second passage. And it is, uh, it is out there. You can find it on Amazon. Um, if you want to even get the first chapter of it free, you can go to our website, um, which is restorationproject.net slash first chapter. Uh, and what it is, Troy, is this. It's, it's, as I just said a moment ago, it is this exploration into if growing into that elder, if growing into that sage is actually the pinnacle of manhood, we have no roadmap for what that looks like. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to get there. We don't know what is required of us, what we need to kind of uh, attend to in the first half of our lives so that the, then we are free to step into the second half of our lives. And that was my endeavor uh, it, to, to kind of create some kind of roadmap. And I myself am just at the beginning of that journey. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was far more like my own explorations of what is my hope for myself what is my hope for my friends, my brothers, the guys that are my peers uh, that are in this middle middle stage of life? And, and where are we going? Uh, the reality is we, we don't have a roadmap for it. And I think because of how masculinity has been understood in the general society, 
back to what we were talking about a while ago, the warrior and the king and all that, that's kind of what we understand to be the pinnacle of manhood. When in reality, behind every hero, there is another hero. You mentioned, you mentioned Gandalf. Like what would Lord of the Rings be without Gandalf? What would, who would Luke Skywalker be without Yoda? Who would Harry Potter be without Dumbledore? There is always, always, always an older guy, an older woman, an older guide that is there to not give advice, but to give presence in order for the next generation to step into really the wholeness of their lives that as God designed us to be. So that's what Sage is all about. Yeah, that's awesome. And you can find it on Amazon, you said? Yep, it's on Amazon. Yeah, that's great. Well, well, Chris, thank you so much for taking time with us. And uh, I'm so excited about the work you're doing. And it's it's good work. Thank you. you. Know, it, is, it is good work. And uh, and I pray that the Lord refreshes you in it. Uh, having lived a previous life as a counselor for a while, it can be tough. Yeah. Uh, and so I pray the Lord blesses you, refreshes you, and you find, you know, just such a a pleasure in the Lord from the Lord for the things that you're putting your hands to. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you. And thanks again for having me today. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the podcast. So until next time, be awesome.